We are absolutely delighted to have Professor John Wyatt, emeritus professor um, of uh, neonatal paediatrics and perinatology uh, at University College London and president of the Christian Medical Fellowship with us as the 2019 uh, lecturer. John is also a senior researcher at Cambridge University's Faraday Institute. He's the author of a book called Matters of Life and Death, and most recently of a book entitled Dying Well. We're delighted to have such an august researcher and scientist uh, deliver our 2019 lecture. Can we just give Professor John White a warm Yorkshire welcome? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, warm welcome. It's a real privilege for me to be here and to tackle uh, what is a really challenging, difficult topic. And I have to say, right from the beginning, the question of what it means to be human and particularly how we relate this to advances in neuroscience is, are some of the most profound, troubling and complex questions of all. I mean, the human brain is often said to be the most uh, complex item in the entire universe. And so if you've come expecting some nice, slick, simple answers to difficult questions, I'm sorry, you're going to be terribly disappointed because I haven't got any nice, slick, simple answers. In fact, I don't think there are any nice, slick, simple answers. I mean, if I wanted to summarise the lecture in, in one sentence, it might be something like, actually, being human is, is a bit of a mystery. Uh, but I think, I hope we can see a bit more than that as we uh, wrestle with this topic together. So as you've heard, my background is as a baby doctor. Um, I've spent many years working in an intensive care unit for babies in central London. And uh, I went into this kind of medicine because I love children and it was a very challenging and interesting area of medicine. But actually, uh, in my work, I realised I was in the midst of an ethical maelstrom, all kinds of questions were being raised about what's the value of life of a tiny premature baby. If there's brain damage, like here, what does this mean? If there's bleeding into the brain and we know that the child's going to be disabled, uh, is it ever right to switch off life support machinery? And um, how do we think about this uh, tiny little being? So it's really out of my clinical experience um, that I became more and more interested in these fundamental philosophical and ethical questions. What does it mean to be human? Are you still a person if you're a tiny premature baby? Are you still a person if you're someone in a profound coma? Uh, it, it seems almost as though medicine pushes to destruction these ideas and raises very difficult and challenging questions. I've worked for many years at UCL also both as a clinician but also as an academic researcher and um, using, uh, this was some of the research I did with our research team, trying to understand the mechanisms of brain injury in very uh, complex situations of babies who've been exposed to shortage of oxygen at birth. Um, so I've, I'm speaking to you as somebody from the shop floor, as somebody who's done science for many years and who understands both the amazing power of scientific research and also some of the uh, difficulties and challenges that science, science leads to. I'm going to go quite fast. Um, so hang on. Uh, if there are questions that, uh, that rise, then as you've heard, there are, we, well, there'll be opportunities for us to uh, debate and discuss questions as we go along. But just if I had to summarise some of the lessons I've learned from my own research, these would be three of them. First of all, reality is always stranger than you think. Uh, in fact, uh, a very eminent um, physicist said that not only is reality stranger than we think, actually, reality is stranger than we can think. There's, there's a, actually something about the very nature of, uh, of, of the cosmos, which is uh, almost beyond um, what, what human beings are. But uh, secondly, the simplistic explanations are nearly always wrong. And thirdly, you have to follow the evidence where it leads. And I think those are useful things to have as we, as, we, uh, as we look at some of those challenging questions. Reality is strange. Simplistic explanations are nearly always wrong. 
Let's follow the evidence where it leads. And it's interesting, Thomas Huxley, um, a very eminent scientist, but not a Christian, wrote this, Science seems to me to teach in the highest and strongest manner the great truth which is embodied in the Christian conception of entire surrender to the will of God. Sit down before fact as a little child. Be prepared to give up every preconceived notion. Follow humbly and to whatever abysses nature leads. How you shall learn nothing. So there is an attitude of a real scientist who's prepared to follow the evidence where it leads. How far can science take us? Well, some people think that science is going to be able to answer all the questions we ever have. Here's Bertrand Russell, very eminent philosopher. Whatever knowledge is obtainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. So the only way of really knowing anything is through science, says Bertrand Russell. Peter Atkins said the same kind of thing. I consider that there is nothing that the scientific method cannot illuminate because the scientific method has not yet encountered a barrier. My optimism leads me to suppose that the reach of its beam is boundless. And yet, some other very eminent scientists have come to a very different conclusion. Peter Medawar said, a very eminent scientist, and said this, the limits of science are, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions, such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of existence. So science can take us so far, but it can't necessarily take us all the way. So as we tr try and look at this question, what does it mean to be humans? It's interesting to look back into history and to see how people have tried to answer that question. What does it mean to be human? And one of the interesting things in the history of ideas is that as human beings, we've always tried to understand what it means to be human by reference to the leading technology of the culture we happen to live in. But then what tends to happen is that steam power comes along and hydraulics. And so this is a, a big stationary steam engine in the Science Museum, which I've actually visited and seen working. And um, lo and behold, hydraulics becomes the dominant metaphor for understanding what it means to be human. And the whole idea of the circulation of the blood and the lymphatics and so on. In fact, some people have suggested that Freud's theory of the human psyche, of human psychology, is basically hydraulics. You've got this incompressible fluid called libido. And the pressure builds up and it builds up and then it comes bursting out in all sorts of ways. I mean, this is just hydraulics. And, um, but now we live in a world which is dominated by information technology. This is a supercomputer. And lo and behold, the human being must be some kind of computer. The human being must be a way to understand what it means to be human is that we too are some kind of information processing systems. Marvin Minsky, a well-known roboticist, puts it very crudely. The brain happens to be a meat machine. And this is Thomas uh, Stephen Pinker who said, Thomas Hobbes' pithy equation of reasoning as nothing but reckoning. So Hobbes was the first person to come up with the idea that thinking was something to do with computation. Is one of the great ideas in human history. The cognitive feats of the brain can be explained in physical terms. To put it crudely, and critics notwithstanding, we can say that, and do you see what's going on here? It's exactly the same thing. Beliefs are a kind of information... Thinking is a kind of computation. Motivation is a kind of feedback and control. There it is again. Let's use the best technology to understand what it means to be human. Pinker goes on. This is a great idea because it completes a naturalistic understanding of the universe, exercising occult souls, spirits, and ghosts in the machine. Just as Darwin made it possible for a thoughtful observer of the natural world to do without creationism... Turing and others made it possible for a thoughtful observer of the cognitive world to do without spiritualism. So you can see the motivation. If once we adopt this machine understanding, then we can get rid of all that stuff about spirits and souls and gods because we're just computers. We're just computers made out of meat. It's interesting that that idea is getting dominant, particularly in the area of robotics. 
three of these beings are Homo sapiens, and three of these beings are robots. And in fact, you can go onto YouTube and you can find a, a video where all six of them are seated around a circular table and they're having a sort of conversation. And as the camera goes round, it's very, very difficult to work out who are the human beings and who they aren't. And there's a very interesting character called Professor Ishiguru in Japan, Osaka University. And he explicitly makes these robots to be as close to himself as possible. And when he's asked why does he do it, he says, one of the major goals of my project is to understand what a human being is like. So by creating this simulacrum, this, this artificial human, the hope is this will actually reveal to us what it means to be human. And more and more of us, we, are, we hear these metaphors. We hear about people, this machine metaphor, that, that we, we hear about sort of information overload or people being hardwired or programmed. This kind of machine metaphor is, is so common. Of course, we're just biological machines. We're just reproductive machines. We're, we're information processing machines. But actually, that kind of language is actually profoundly confusing because it's critically important to recognize the difference between a useful metaphor and a fundamental description. So when you say that the brain is a machine, you're actually using a metaphor. You're saying there is something similar between something like a machine. The brain is like a machine. But it's actually... So there are many aspects of the human brain which are machine-like. And in fact, that analogy, that metaphor, has been extremely useful. There's a whole branch, for instance, of computational neuroscience treating the, the, the brain as though it was, as, as the, using the metaphor is an extremely useful metaphor. Cognitive neuropsychology also using um, information processing ideas, metaphors. But well, if you say the brain is a machine... Actually, you're saying something that's both false, but it's even worse than that, it's actually incoherent, it's meaningless. Why is that? Well, the definition of a machine is that it's an artifact which is created by a human being in order to achieve a human purpose. That's what a machine is. That's the definition of a machine. So when you say the brain is a machine, it doesn't work. It's incoherent. Unfortunately, that concept that, there are, that there's a difference between a metaphor and a description is something which an awful lot of scientists and technologists don't seem to understand. We just get this constant uh, you know, dialogue that, yes, we're machines and we're, and we're reproductive machines and so on. But so I think we need to push back and say, hang on a minute, is this, we're talking about a metaphor here, we're not talking about a definition. So is it possible for us as human beings to actually understand what it means to be human? Is it possible for the human brain to understand the human brain? Actually, there's a, there's a circularity there, which is quite troubling. And as somebody put it, if the human brain was so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't understand anything. <laughs> Do you get the point? The, the, there's, a, there's a problem in the very task of, try, of the human brain trying to understand itself, trying to, to, to fundamentally understand how it works. Having said that, of course, neuroscience has made dramatic progress over the last 20 years. One of the most outstanding and astounding discoveries was in some patients who were thought to have profound brain injury and were in the persistent vegetative state. And these researchers um, put um, some patients in the persistent vegetative state inside a functional MRI scanner and they then spoke to this person who was completely unresponsive, just lying as though thought to be in a deep coma. And they asked the person to imagine they were playing a game of tennis. And in some cases, lo and behold, specific areas in the motor cortex lit up as the person was imagining playing the game of tennis, exactly the same as happened in a healthy control. And then they asked the person to do a completely different task, and that was to imagine walking around their home, walking from room to room, navigating around their home. So there's a lot of advances. You can see how neuroscience is giving us very profound insights into 
the nature of the brain and also understanding more about our humanity and how, for instance, empathy actually works, what the neuroscientific basis of that is. It's interesting also that it allows, at least some people claim, it allows uh, people to work out whether people are telling the truth or not. Sophisticated kind of lie detector. And lo and behold, there's a commercial company called No Lie MRI, Inc., <laughs> <laughs> which claims that they, by putting someone in the scanner and then asking them questions, they can work out whether or not you're telling the truth because different areas of the brain will light up. And however much you try to suppress that, uh, your brain activation will, uh, will reveal it. Another area is what's called neuromarketing, which is quite bizarre. And this is the idea where adverts, before they're released, they're tested out on volunteers in order to see what kind of brain activation the advert is actually causing. And the adverts are tweaked to cause the maximum amount of brain activation. And have you noticed, for instance, that if you're seeing a car advert on the television or in the cinema, that car adverts don't seem to go in for telling you lots about information about the acceleration from 0 to 60, or the road holding in the wet, or the fuel consumption, or anything like that. What do you get in car adverts? Answer, you get moody shots of forests at night, you get deserted roads, you get mountain vistas. Notice how all the roads are always empty. There's a single car going through. Why are, the, why are the adverts like that? Well, it turns out, by neuromarketing techniques, that they produce far greater brain activation than statistics about 0 to 60 acceleration. And particularly, that those kind of adverts activate the deep emotional centers, the deep limbic systems in the center of the brain, without, well, causing very little cognitive processing. And so the idea is that you will, you will learn to associate the particular brand of the car with this deep emotional limbic activation, so that when you actually go into the car sales room, you see this car and you say, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about this car. I mean, it just makes you feel, wow, so that's the one I want to buy. And it works. It actually works. And so this, this kind of neuromarketing, if you don't believe me, these are the companies, just of one particular article I saw, that were, were using this particular commercial form of, of neuromarketing in order to... Uh, encourage us and, and or manipulate us to choose in a particular way. Another and a quite troubling thing which is going on is the ability using sophisticated technology to interpret people's emotions from their faces. This is actually taken from China and this is a surveillance camera which is able to recognize and identify all these different people, just simplify their facial characteristics using artificial intelligence, comparing them with massive databases. But it's, you can do much more than just recognize a face. So just recently, this little chip has been produced. This is a chip. It's about not much bigger than the size of my thumbnail. But it can, and this little chip is the most amazingly sophisticated AI processing and the manufacturers claim this, is, this little chip can be put into a camera, a sort of surveillance camera, the kind of cameras you have in your home, cameras in streets, cameras behind billboards. And this little chip is able to, uh, in real time, do this kind of analysis, face detection, face recognition, gender estimation, age estimation, expression estimation, facial pose, gaze estimation, blink estimation, hand detection, human body detection. So just imagine if every camera on every billboard, if every camera on every street had one of these chips and the sort of power that this is giving to whoever's controlling the cameras to be able to understand, manipulate. And it's, as the technology advances, it's possible to get enormous amount of information just using sophisticated AI and um, facial analysis. So this is real time software, which is, which is analyzing a face in real time. And I don't know if you can see, but there, there are a number of different emotions. There's happy, anger, sadness, disgust, fear, surprise. And they are all being determined in real time from second to second just by analyzing someone's face. And it turns out that the cam this, this kind of analysis is much better at analyzing our emotions than we ourselves are. So you may not know that you're feeling surprise or disgust or anger, but the camera knows. <laughs> and what's more, in real time, we can use that information. So not only are we detecting faces, but we're able to 
at least in theory, have all this information about emotions. Uh, so this is very, very powerful technology, but really very troubling in terms of who controls this technology, who's using this information. Are they using this information to manipulate us, to coerce us? And this has led to some people thinking that we're actually going to have to develop new human rights in an age of neuroscience and neurotechnology. If you're interested in this, this is a very good paper by Yenka and Adorno in 2017. And they suggested four proposed new human rights. The right to cognitive liberty, which means that we should be free to think whatever we like without being forced. The right to mental privacy, that we should be able to keep our thoughts private, and that no one, unless we give permission, no one should be able to work out what we're thinking. The right to mental integrity, which means that we shouldn't have our thoughts manipulated or coerced without us agreeing. And the right to psychological continuity, which is really about our personalities, that we shouldn't allow our personalities over time to be manipulated and coerced. And they were suggesting that actually the way to do this is to introduce these new human rights and then to introduce legislation in order to protect these rights of cognitive liberty and so on. Just changing directions, one of the big debates that goes on continuously in neuroscience is to what extent are we genuinely free to make decisions and to what extent are we determined by our neuronal, our brain mechanisms? And there's a very famous experiment done in 1983 by the neuroscientist Benjamin Libe, or Libet, depending on how you pronounce it. And he took volunteers and he asked them to press a button and he told them that they were completely free to, to press the button at any time they wished. But at the, he had a very rapidly moving hand of a clock going around and he asked them to note the point on the clock when they decided to press the button. And at the same time, they were measuring EEG from the brain. And what he showed repeatedly is that the EEG changed in advance of the point at which the person chose to press the button. And Libe then uh, came to the conclusion, this meant that actually the, the belief that this person was free to press the button was completely false. What actually happened was that the brain mechanisms decided, quotes, to, to press the finger down, and then the awareness of the intention followed the brain mechanisms. And some people have gone on to say, well, this proves, therefore, that free will is an illusion and that we're just programmed by our, by our brain mechanisms. There's been a lot of pushback and debate about these experiments and other similar experiments. And I personally, personally feel that this is actually a very unreliable and unhelpful kind of experiment. Because if you think about it, just put yourself in the place of the volunteer. You're sitting there with your finger on the button. You're you know you're going to press this button. You're waiting to press this button. You're thinking about pressing this button, but you're not quite sure whether you're going to press it yet. Now I'm not going to do it. Now I'm going to do it now. No, I'm going to do it now. <laughs> now, is that some kind of real model of free choice? Of you know, particularly motor action, where we know that motor action is often very automatic. We know that you can be driving a car or walking down the street and not thinking at all about what your hands and feet are. So actually, I suspect that this is a really rather long way away from the sort of me trying to decide how I'm going to give this lecture and which order I'm going to use my slides, where I believe I'm actually free. I can choose which slides to show when and what to say about them. It's not my brain mechanisms that are, that are forcing me to put slides in a particular order and forcing me to say particular words. So, so I personally believe that this experiment doesn't tell us a great deal about the nature of free will, but a lot of neuroscientists refer to it. And many neuroscientists have come to the idea that, the, that free will and our sense even of being a self, all of these things are just illusions. They're not real. Here's Susan Blackmore. There are three interlinked issues here. Self, consciousness, free will. I think they're all illusions. And many scientists have said that. Here's Matt Ridley. There is no me inside my brain. There's only an ever-changing set of brain states, a distillation of history, emotion, instinct, experience, the influence of other people, not to mention chance. And uh, on our neonatal unit, we used to have a, a book of wise sayings. And one of the wise sayings was this, the most profound thought of man 
is simply an exchange of potassium for sodium. <laughs> Anybody who's done biology will recognize why that is. Here's Francis Crick, very well known for being one of the discoverers of DNA. You, your joys and your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. So this has become the sort of new orthodoxy. There is no self. There is no... We're all just mechanisms. We're all just pro processes going on. And we're all programmed. And therefore, if someone like me, who happens to be a Christian believer, well, of course, people say, well, of course, you're just programmed. There's some kind of, some, some kind of mishap in your brain functioning when you've got these weird beliefs about God and so on. Now, unfortunately, determinism is not quite that simple because if I'm programmed to believe in God, then hang on a minute, you must be programmed to believe that I'm programmed. <laughs> Because what's true for me is true for you. We're all of us programmed, and therefore your beliefs about whatever, atheism or neuroscience or Benjamin Liebet's experiment, you're, they're just as much determined as my beliefs. So that's the problem with determinism. It actually like it cuts off the branch on which you're sawing. And in fact, it makes all science completely impossible. Because if we're all, in, if we're all determined, what's the, point in, what's the point in me giving the lecture? What's the point in you sitting there? I mean, you know, we're all just going through our mechanisms, uh, clicking away. And the whole purpose about science, and, and uh, it doesn't seem to have any point. Very interesting. Charles Darwin himself was aware of this problem. And this is sometimes called Charles Darwin's horrid doubt. In a letter, a private letter, he wrote, But then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy? Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind? If there are any convictions in such a mind. And so this is a deep, deep problem in Darwinism. Because what Darwinism says is that the human brain evolved to give you a survival advantage on the African savannah. It allowed you to escape from tigers a little better or to find berries a little better, and therefore it gave you this survival advantage on the African savanna. And that's the reason we have a big cerebral cortex and so on compared to other mammals and so on. But what that means is that the entire purpose of the human brain is about survival. It's absolutely nothing to do with truth. It's nothing to do with meaning. It's all about survival. It's all about fitness, your ability to pass your genes on to the next generation. And so if there's a toss-up, a, 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 a sort of conflict between whether your brain is going to tell you something that helps you to survive or whether your brain is going to tell you something that's true, then it's absolutely clear what's going to happen. Your brain is going to tell you something to survive, something to help you survive. That's what brains are for. So why on earth should you trust anything that happens in your brain, including the ideas about Darwinism? <laughs> So again, there's a circularity here. There's a real problem about whether or not anything that brains produce can be trusted. Any of the ideas, because all those ideas are simply to help us to survive. So there are problems with determinism. Now this is a bit sort of a bit of philosophy here, and apologies. You can switch off and, and wake up again in three minutes if, just, as I just go through this. So, this is the, probably the commonest idea that neuroscientists have about what, how, what is going on in our heads. And the idea is that there is something going on. There's input, sensory input, coming in through our eyes and ears and so on. It goes into our brains. Our brains do a whole lot of whirring. Things go out. We behave. We move. Our arms move. My lips go up and down. And then there's more input. And basically, all these things just go round and round and round. But out of the neuronal processing, there's some kind of froth. And that froth is conscious awareness. That froth is this belief that we have a self. But it's what philosophers call an epiphenomenon. It isn't really of any significance. All the real stuff is going on down in the machinery. As we said, that causes all kinds of problems and questions about what on earth we're doing here tonight if this is just froth and really all that's happening is our different... Uh, machines are all whirring away. Now, there is another um, very long, uh, going all the way back to Descartes, 
a different way of understanding, and that's substance dualism. And that says there are two kinds of stuff. There's the mind, and there's the brain, and these are completely separate types of stuff. And yes, we've still got all that stuff going down in the brain, but then we've got a completely different kind of stuff, which is what's going on in our heads, this conscious awareness. This is mind stuff. And then there must be some kind of connection between these two kinds of stuff. So when I stub my toe, I feel, ouch, so something's gone from my brain to my mind. And similarly, when I decide to lift my arm, it started in my mind, but it ended up moving my body. And so the problem with substance dualism is to work out how on earth these two different types of stuff actually communicate with each other. And Descartes famously thought it was something to do with the pineal gland because it was right in the centre of the brain and nobody knew what it did. Uh, but, you know, I think that's widely now derided. And so this, but nonetheless, substance dualism is still around. There's a third idea, and that is that we've got this stuff going down and somehow, in mysterious ways, out of this neuronal activity emerges this stuff going on in my head, consciousness. And what's even more mysterious is having emerged into my consciousness, this emergent stuff now somehow seems to work downwards and actually change it so I can move and lift my arm. Um, now, how that actually works is very mysterious, and it seems to involve quite a lot of hand-waving, as I was doing then before. But I rather like this slide, where there's a sort of two professors looking at the blackboard, and there's a whole load of equations on the left-hand side, and there's a whole load of equations on the right-hand side, and then they say then a miracle occurs. <laughs> he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> and I think that's the problem with emergent monism. It's, 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 in the end, it's just some kind of miracle. How does it work? So what is a person? Uh, this is a very famous definition going all the way back to Boethius in the 6th century AD. He said a person is an individual substance of a rational nature. In other words, it's rationality which is the most important part of being a person. And, and that kind of definition was very important in the history of the West. It put this enormous emphasis on rational thinking as being the single most important part of being a person. More recently, a number of philosophers, in, especially Peter Singer, have argued that really what's important about being a person is that they are able to be self-aware and to make choices, exercising preferences about continuing life. So Singer would argue that there are human beings who are human non-persons, like a newborn baby or like an old person with brain injury or with dementia, because they aren't able to make choices or they may not be aware of their own existence. And there are non-human persons, he would say like a chimpanzee um, or a, a dog or an elephant, um, who, who is a person because they are able to make choices. John Harris, another philosopher, has a similar kind of saying, a being who is capable of valuing your own existence. The value of my life is precisely the value I give to my own life. If I know that I exist, then I can value my life. But the problem with these kind of definitions, especially for me as a baby doctor, is it, it means that actually all these babies I'm caring for, they're not people. They're not, they're not because they're not aware of their own existence. They're not able to choose. So it divides the human race into two categories. One group who are choosers, who are real people, and then this other group of sort of human non-persons, uh, people with brain injury, with learning difficulties, with this other kind of uh, any, anything which interferes with normal brain processing. And I, for one, feel very unhappy in, uh, about that. And behind all this is the modern idea of autonomy, autonomos, which literally means I make my own laws. And it's interesting that in modern liberal thinking, it's choosing, it's autonomy, that which gives personhood its meaning and value. But, you know, I find it very, very interesting. So in the area of ethics, autonomy is king. In the area of medical ethics, for instance, autonomy is regarded as the supremely important factor. It's all about choice. It's all about people choosing what to do with them, their bodies, choosing what to do with their self. And yet, as we've just seen... On the one hand, you've got all these people saying it's all about autonomy. And on the other hand, you've got the neuroscientists saying, hang on a minute, there is no self. It's all an illusion. And I think there's a profound incoherence here between, on the one hand, the liberal emphasis on individual autonomy 
And on the other hand, the dominant view of neuroscientific physicalism, which regards the self as an illusion created by... They can't both be right. One of these... I, I predict that in the coming decades, one of these is going to win. And do you know which one I think is going to win? Answer neuroscience. I think increasingly autonomy will be regarded as an illusion. We're, that actually we are not free. And that in the end the neuroscientists will win. But does it make sense? You know, in order to do science, you have to believe that it's possible for the human brain to work out the fundamental rules of the universe, the deep and mysterious order on which the universe is based. I mean, if you, if you don't believe that, you can't do science. You have to believe it's possible for the human brain to do that. But if you think about it, why should we think that a humble, pathetic, carbon-based life form that happens to be on the unfashionable arm part of the one, a spiral arm uh, you know, of a particular <laughs> galaxy. Why should we think that this pathetic carbon-based life form should be able to understand the fundamental rules, the order of the physical universe? And you see, if you accept the naturalist and Darwinian understanding of the evolution of human brain, then there's no reason to think that the convictions and the beliefs and the conclusions, as we've said, uh, have any relationship to ultimate reality or truth. In fact, it's rather unlikely that they would do so. So, Albert Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity and this bizarre idea that as the massive objects would actually twist space-time, the very nature of space-time, around him... Um, and the effect of an intense gravitational field. And if that's true, then the gravitational field that the Earth exists, that the Earth produces, must actually be twisting space and time around it as the Earth moves through space and as it rotates. And Einstein's equations... I'm going to test you on this afterwards. This is Einstein's <laughs> theories of general relativity, and uh, as you all know. And... Um, the, the equations predicted precisely how much twisting of space-time would happen as the Earth went through space. And NASA sent up a satellite using the most sophisticated technology, including the most precise gyroscopes ever created in the history of humankind, in order to test whether or not Einstein's theory of relativity worked. And you know what? They found it worked to the highest level of precision they could, to more than six decimal places, the precise amount. You see, look at the tiny amounts, the frame-dragging procession the, and so on that was, that was predicted. It turned out that it was exactly obeyed. Now, don't you think that's a bit strange? That out of the brain of this carbon-based life form that was only developed in order to help survival on the African savanna turned out to be able to develop equations, which, abstract equations, which predicted the precise nature of how space was being distorted by gravity. Do you think that's a bit weird? How does that, why does that happen? How could that possibly happen if you were to take a physicalist understanding? And as Albert Einstein himself said, the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. Why on earth are we able to understand it? So, secondly, in order to do science, you have to be, believe that you are genuinely free to create hypotheses and models, to design experiments, to choose the most consistent interpretation of the data. As a scientist, you have to be free. Otherwise, if you are determined, there's no way that you can do science. It depends on the existence of genuine, not illusory choice. But reductive physicalism tells us that there's no such thing. In fact, the one thing that physicalist science tells us is that physicalist science is untrustworthy, if not impossible, because we're all determined. So another uh, philosopher has said, well, therefore, there must be an, perhaps a different way of thinking about it. Perhaps mind itself is the fundamental thing. And Thomas Nagel, well-known atheistic philosopher, has argued this. The intelligibility of the world is no accident. Mind, in this view, is doubly related to the natural order. Nature is such as to give rise to conscious beings with minds, and it is such as to be intelligent to conscious minds. And in fact, Nagel believes in something called panpsychism, which is that absolutely everything is conscious, not just human beings, but actually animals, but not just animals, but actually material things. They all have an element of consciousness. 
That's panpsychism. Well, these, I've looked at a number of different philosophies. I do want to come now and just think, just very briefly, as we're coming towards the end, to think about the Christian worldview and what Christianity might have to say about this. And it seems to me what the Christian thinking has said is that reality consists of more than just matter and energy. There's something else there. There's something else about reality. But in Christian thinking, at least one way of thinking about this, is that it's not mind, it's not consciousness. No, it's personhood. It's all about being a person. And Martin Buber was a, a Jewish existentialist philosopher, but he wrote famously about the difference between an I-it relationship and an I-you relationship. And it's something we all intuitively understand. Yes, we have a relationship to things, to machines, to the cosmos, to science. That's an I-it relationship. But we understand there's something else which is completely different, and that is the relationship to another person, an I-you relationship. And so in this way of thinking, personhood is a category of reality that is, to use philosophical jargon, ontologically foundational. What that means is you can't define a person in something more basic. When Boethius said that a person was an individual substance of a rational nature, he's using rationality as more fundamental than personhood. But in this way of thinking, the most basic thing you can say is that someone is a person. A person's not reducible to matter and energy. They're not limited to matter and energy. And this way of thinking about personhood actually comes from Christian. The, the whole concept of the person is a Christian concept. It emerges out of Christian theology in the 3rd and the 4th century. Interestingly, the ancient Greek world had no concept of the person. They, what they knew was something they called the persona. And the persona is the social face, the mask that you, that you live out in society. But the early church fathers, as they were reflecting on the nature of the Trinity, of the Godhead, they came up with the concept of the person. They said that the, the, the Godhead consisted of three persons. And the persons were related to one another. The, in fact, they said the persons are constituted by their relations. So the father can only be father if the son exists. And the son can only be the son if the father exists. So the very being of the father depends on the son. The very being of the son depends on the father. The persons are constituted by their relations, by the movement of communion, the freedom to give themselves to one another. And in fact, they said to be a person is to participate in some sense in the divine life of the triune God. So in some sense, the ultimate persons in Christian thinking are the persons of the Trinity... And we, if you like, are sub-persons. We are persons who reflect the ultimate persons. So in this way of thinking, you know, Descartes said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But this way of thinking turns it on its head. It says, you love me, therefore I am. That our being is actually constituted in, our, in the relations we have with other and so persons are different from machines, and they're different from everything else in the cosmos. Persons are knowers. They know things about reality. Persons are agents. They do things. They have intentions and volitions. Persons are rational. They understand. They use logical analysis. Persons are communicative. They speak in order to be understood by other persons. They reach out to other persons. Persons are creative. They're genuinely innovative and free. Persons are moral. They understand good and evil. Persons are lovers. They enter into profound and committed relationships of union and communion with one another. That's what it means to be a person. And that's what it means to be a human being. And in the early chapters of Genesis, God says, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness. So as human beings, we, we are godlike beings in this way of thinking. We reflect the very reality of God himself. So human beings are not self-explanatory. Our meaning is derivative. It's, it's derived from outside ourselves. And because we are godlike beings, our thinking... Our mental processes, our subjective awarenesses are somehow homologous or they copy the mind of God. 
and hence the fundamental structures of the cosmos. You see, so Christian thinking explains why something that's going on in my mind could actually relate to what's out there in the cosmos. Answer, because God is a mind and because that mind creates the cosmos and because we are created in God's image, then our minds are also able to understand the fundamental order in the cosmos. And as the famous astronomer Kepler said, as he worked out his equations of planetary motion, Kepler said, actually, it wasn't me who designed the equations of planetary motion. It was God himself, the mind behind the cosmos, which came up those, with those equations. But I am thinking God's thoughts after him. So I'm coming to the end, but you know, I can't talk about persons without actually talking about some real human beings. And one of the most extraordinary things to me as a, pers as a baby doctor is that some of the most remarkable persons I've ever met have not been the wonderful specimens of humanity. They've not been the Nobel Prize winners and the Olympic athletes and the world statesmen. And I think of this little baby called Baby Christopher, who I got to know some years ago, uh, his parents, uh, Alan and Verity, it was their first child, they were pregnant, and then tragically it turned out that the baby they were carrying, she was carrying in her womb, had very major genetic abnormalities, a condition called Edwards syndrome, a genetic chromosomal abnormality, which is universally fatal. And she came under a great deal of pressure to have an abortion, because what possible reason would there be to go on with the pregnancy? Why put yourself through it? Why put the baby through it? If you know that the baby's going to die, surely the loving thing to do would be to have an abortion. But after a great deal of heart searching, Alan and Verity said, you know, we feel this is the baby that we've been given and we must love our baby and care for the baby. And little baby Christopher was born. And to everyone's surprise, he didn't die straight away. And in fact, they were able to take him home. And they used to bring him along to the church I go to in central London where he became a sort of mini-celebrity. And he was only five pounds, 2.5 kilos, but everybody wanted to have a cuddle with baby Christopher, and they used to get passed from arm to arm, and he was this very sort of placid baby, and he would be just be being passed around the church. Everybody was, oh, look at the baby. And in fact, baby Christopher was a was, was very well-known member of the church family, and he lived for about seven months, and then he got weaker and weaker, and very gently he passed away. And a memorial service was held in the church, and 400 people came to pay tribute to this tiny little baby. And when he was born, he was five pounds weight, and when he died, he was still five pounds weight. And one of Alan and Verity's friends said, you know, Christopher couldn't grow, but he helped other people to grow. And it was true. He touched so many lives. Now, some people would say, he's not a person. He's just a brain-damaged baby. But actually, I think those of us who knew him knew that actually this was an IU relationship. Baby Christopher was a unique and wonderful person, and as each one of us can be. And as the philosopher said, love is a way of saying to a person, it's good that you exist. It's good that you're in the world. That's what love always says. It's good that you exist. Whatever your problems, whatever your disabilities, whatever your struggles, and we all have, have them, it's good that you exist. It's good that you're in the world. So, to close, reality is always stranger than you think. The simplistic explanations are nearly always wrong. Let's follow the evidence where it leads. So which understanding of personhood makes most sense, which fits the evidence best? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Really great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.